Hi guys, welcome to Precision Horology. Uh, up today we have a beautiful vintage Omega constellation uh, for your consideration, which we are going to be uh, servicing. So we're going to completely strip down the movement and we're going to clean it, fix any issues with it, change any parts that might need changing, repair anything that needs repairing, uh, lubricate it, uh, put it back together, uh, complete the process, timing, uh, and all that fun stuff that is involved in a complete service. Now, this particular constellation um, is a gold-capped model. Uh, we can see here uh, the steel base, and we have the capping with gold. Um, this particular example is really in uh, quite fantastic condition. Um, it, it looks like it's sat in a drawer most of its life. Uh, we can see dial and hands are in, uh, in really beautiful shape. Um, the case, we have nice strong lines on the case. Our gold plating or gold capping isn't worn. Um, original Omega Crystal. Uh, we can see the embossed Omega logo uh, there uh, in the center. Um, beautiful original Omega crown. Uh, now the customer's goal uh, with this particular timepiece is to keep the watch as original as possible. So we won't be too concerned um, with factors like waterproofing. Uh, so we're going to be keeping the original crown uh, intact. We're going to be keeping the original crystal, assuming we don't discover any, any cracks or anything like that um, around the edges. We'll obviously put a new case back gasket in. Um, another issue is we have a beautiful original Omega buckle on this watch and a very lovely, very lovely uh, buffalo strap here. Uh, however, the incorrect spring bars have been used, um, so they're very difficult to get out. So I'm actually going to be using a small piercing saw, and I'm going to saw out the spring bars um, so that we can keep the original strap uh, and obviously not damage the case in any way by trying to pry them out um, and using the case as leverage. So that's how we're going to tackle um, the spring bar situation. So let's open this up and see what she looks like inside. So uh, we can have a look in the case back here and reveal the model number. There's a 167005. 167005. So that's the reference number that we're working with here. Um, the watch has a 20 million serial number. Uh, which puts it around 1963, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so definitely a beautiful, uh, beautiful watch that's been preserved well. Uh, we have an Omega 551 movement, uh, which is based off uh, the 550. So initial reports seem that the movement is in quite good condition. It doesn't look like we've had a lot of servicing of this watch over the years. Um, uh, screws are in nice condition. Parts don't really seem worn um, at all. Uh, something to look out for with Vintage Omegas is, or the 550 series, is a worn automatic weight axle or post. Um, we would see rubbing on the plates, but here we don't seem to have any rubbing, uh, and that post seems to be quite tight. So it's indication that this watch uh, hasn't been used very much. Um, at all, to be completely honest. We do see some oxidization, uh, some rust on certain steel components. Uh, we see some rust on the crown wheel here, uh, and we can see some rust on the ratchet wheel here as well. Uh, so that is something that we can take care of. We can remove that rust as best as possible, and we can salvage uh, those original parts. So I'm going to go ahead and get this rotor off and uh, drop the movement out of the case so we can take a closer look at the dial and hands. So I've removed the dial and hands and... Uh, my apologies. I've uh, uncased the watch and I've removed the, uh, the oscillating weight. And here we can see uh, the dial and hands are ready to be removed. Truly a beautiful dial and hand set here. This thing is just in absolutely stunning condition. You don't see too many like this. Um, these are the watches I just love working on because you just can appreciate 
the fact that they're just so incredibly preserved, um, just absolutely beautiful. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to remove the dial and hands, uh, and then we can take a close look at the movement uh, and see what we're working with. Now, I'm not going to actually uh, remove the dial and hands on camera because I need to uh, use quite a lot of focus um, and be the most comfortable I can uh, to make sure that no damage occurs. But uh, I thought I would talk about um, the way to remove dials and hands. Um, we would use hand lifting levers in this situation, uh, which we get underneath the hands um, and pry up with gentle pressure on the dial and lift the hands off the dial. Um, very important to make sure that we cover the dial and the hands so as to avoid damage. Now you can buy um, covers for this situation, reusable, but I like to use uh, these polythene bags. And what I do is I break open the bag like so, and I open it up and I use the fresh clean inside to place over. And I only use it for one, um, use to make sure that absolutely no damage occurs so it's as, as, as clean as possible so that no debris and dirt gets stuck on there uh, and uh, causes damage to the, the dial and hands. So I'm going to go ahead and do that and then we can see what we're looking at. So we now have our dial and hands removed. Um, we can store those to one side uh, so as to make sure uh, that no damage uh, occurs to them there. So we'll store them like this uh, in small containers so that uh, no damage uh, can happen to those uh, and we can look at the movement. So here we have our Omega 551. Uh, it's a non-date model uh, and it is a chronometer as we could see indicated on our dial. So originally uh, it would have been regulated to plus six minus four seconds uh, over five positions and different temperatures. So we're going to get to work on dismantling this movement uh, and seeing what we find uh, as we go along. So the first thing we're going to do is remove uh, the hour wheel here um, in the center. Now I believe that we should have a dial washer here uh, on this movement. I don't see any reason why we wouldn't, but uh, I'm going to look that up and double check, but uh, I don't see why we wouldn't. Um, and next, we're going to remove our cannon pinion uh, in the center here with our cannon pinion removal tool. Like so. It just uh, lifts up, provides pressure uh, on the plates, and then we can remove our cannon pinion. Now, when we... Um, dismantle the movement we like to check uh, components as we go so everything looks to be functioning correctly um, on this side which is a good thing uh, what we will do at this point is we will flip the watch over to the movement side and see what we're working with now I'm going to fully wind the watch at this point uh, and then we're going to take some initial timing results uh, to see what we're working with. Uh, is the watch keeping good time? Uh, is the watch keeping bad time? It's good just to have a baseline with these results uh, so we know what we're working with. And when we service the watch and have a look, we can compare uh, the two results. So we should be fully wound there. So we'll head over to the timing machine uh, and see what we're looking at. So we can see here that initial results are looking quite good. Um, the watch is not running terribly. Um, we've set our lift angle to 49 degrees, which is the correct lift angle, so we can get an accurate reading and representation of what the um, amplitude uh, of the watch is. So we can see we have a 244 degree amplitude and we have a loss of about minus six seconds. Um, that's in our horizontal. We'll check our other horizontal position uh, so as to see um, if we get a drastic difference or everything's looking relatively the same. We need to give some time uh, for it to stabilize so that we can see what we're working with. So we have about a plus second, plus seven second gain, uh, plus eight, plus nine, and looking at amplitude around 240. 
So you've definitely got a bit more of a gain in that position. But uh, I think we could sort that out. Let me have a bit of a drop in amplitude too. Let's check out crown down positions uh, to see what we're working with. We're always going to have a lower amplitude in the crown down positions just due to the fact that uh, there's more friction on the pivots of the train wheels. Uh, so it's not going to perform as well. And you can see that decrease in power and that decrease in amplitude. Now we have a low amplitude of 210. We'll let that stabilize, but we're looking a bit low. So amplitude is something that we definitely want to address. Um, timing is certainly not terrible uh, for a watch of this age, but uh, we'll see what we can do there too. Okay, so let's get to stripping down and seeing what we find. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to want to do is we're going to want to remove our automatic block here. So we're going to unscrew our screws and first thing I note is we've got quite loose screws in this scenario. So we're going to take out our automatic block. I always like to remove things with Rotico like this. Rotico is not great after the watch has been um, serviced because it leaves uh, marks and things, but it's a great tool to use to uh, remove uh, components so as not to leave marks. So let's take a look now at our automatic block. And we can see what we're working with. Plastic peg here. It certainly feels quite tight, not as loose as we would like it. So that's going to benefit uh, from being cleaned, absolutely. So we'll go ahead and dismantle that. We can see that we have some loose rust present on our screws and some of our um, componentry. So what we're going to do is we're going to see if we can shake that clean uh, in the ultrasonic tank in some cleaning fluid. Uh, and then if we can, or can, good, um, but if we cannot, um, then we will... Uh, get to work with some peg wood um, to lightly remove any debris uh, that we may see. So what we need to do here is as we go, we need to use strong magnification uh, to check the pivots uh, and the components uh, that we're looking at to make sure that we don't have any marks or wear uh, for parts that may need to be changed. We can take a casual look uh, in the beginning, but uh, really we need to do it after cleaning so that we know uh, whether we're looking at it as just dirt or it's something greater that needs to be addressed. So we can see dirt and relative, uh, well, we can see the kind of things that we would expect to see um, from a watch of this age that hasn't been serviced in, in a very long time. See some pretty dry, dry pivots there. So it looks to me that this watch has been serviced at some point. Uh, there's some markings, so it's definitely not uh, not never been serviced, but all in all, it's certainly in quite good condition. Uh, the other thing we'll do is we'll peg out the jewels, uh, but we'll have a look uh, at that later. So now what we can do is disassemble our reversing wheel. Our reversing wheel is what helps transfer energy from the oscillating weight uh, to the mainspring so that the watch is wound as we're wearing it. So we'll have a look at uh, disassembling this. So to disassemble this component, we use quite a specific screwdriver 
that's been shaped to uh, undo, as it were, um, this particular wheel. So we're going to go ahead um, and use that screwdriver. There is a tool, uh, there's a block that Omega Cell uh, designed to take this apart, but um, I have my own method uh, of removing it, so I haven't seen the need for purchasing the block. Uh, quite yet. Okay, so you can see this wheel is quite a complex little unit. Um, it used to sell uh, as separate pieces, but it's now an all-in-one piece. So we can see we have these small satellite gears in here um, that work their way around and interact. And so when the watch winds one way, um, they block the other, and then it winds the other, it blocks the other, and so forth. And so that's the makeup uh, of these wheels inside here. So it's good to keep that wheel apart. Obviously, we need to make sure we, we take good care of these satellite pinions so that they don't get lost. But uh, we need to make sure that we clean that wheel apart, because if we keep it together uh, when we clean it, um, it, it has a lot of wear and, and does a lot of work, so keeping it together um, is certainly not the best option uh, for, for making sure that it's working at its peak performance. So we'll um, get back to assembling or disassembling the rest of the watch. So we already talked about the surface rust present. Um, here, so again, we'll see what will uh, vibrate loose with the ultrasonic tank um, and what we have to um, remove manually. But at this point, we would like to let the power down slowly and in a controlled manner. Like so. We let the crown slip through our fingers and release the power uh, of the mainspring there. Okay. So, we want to remove our ratchet wheel at this point in time. So we would remove our ratchet wheel screw. Quite a lot of rust present on the back of that wheel. So that we're definitely going to have to remove manually. Rust present there too. So we'll see what we can clean up. I don't think we're going to have to replace those components. Uh, I think they're going to clean up pretty well. We have our inner ratchet wheel here, which works with our other wheel and our satellite wheel. So we'll remove that. And obviously our core for our crown wheel. We don't want to forget about that because that can get lost. Now, one common wear point 
is the barrel. The bushings wear and need to be replaced. So we want to check our end shake there and we want to check our side shake. Now we seem pretty good here. Again, that really makes sense uh, with the condition of the rest of the watch. So that doesn't seem to be too much of an issue, which is, which is a good thing. Remove our friction spring and screw. And we can check the condition of the friction spring. Usually they take a lot of wear. They uh, develop a dimple um, from the center seconds pinion. So most of the time we replace those. So, and that's the situation here. Uh, we'll definitely be replacing those. It's a small inexpensive component to replace. Um, and then we can take out our center second pinion uh, and examine that. Okay, now what we'll do is we'll remove our barrel bridge. Um, but first we'll check our end shake of our center wheel. End shake looks good there. So we shall delicately remove our barrel bridge screws and we'll check our end shakes here too on our train that looks good That looks good. That looks good too. So it doesn't look like we need to make too many adjustments at this point. So now we'll remove our train bridge screws. Get another little rusted screw there that we might need to clean up. Or we'll replace it just depends. So we can get our bridge off. And we can examine our jewels. When we examine our jewels, we want to see what kind of condition they're in. We want to look for cracks and marks. Uh, obviously, we have dirt on there, which we'll clean out with, with our peg wood before we put through the ultrasonic tank. We'll take out our train and examine our pivots under magnification. At first glance, they truly do look incredible. Um, again, we'll, we'll clean them up and see what they look like after that. But normally, you know, if there's a train wheel pivot cut, something is going to need polishing, burnishing, or perhaps replacing. But, you know, like I said in the beginning, based on the condition of this watch, I'm not surprised. Uh, uh, with the condition of most of the componentry. The rust does surprise me, um, but again, that's a, a gasket and seal issue. So if it was sitting in a damp, humid environment, that uh, that absolutely makes sense. So We'll check our bushing for wear. Again, it all looks quite remarkable. Um, same goes for our, our jewels there, so. Uh, we can remove our center wheel now. And that looks good too. However, our center wheel is a component that we are going to replace. Uh, it's a standard upgrade on these 551 series movements, um, Omega, um, uh, originally installed a small bushing into a tube here. So we have a brass bushing into a tube. That bushing has a tendency to come out. That bushing is what holds the uh, center wheel or the center pinion, I should say. So this center pinion here actually goes through the middle of the center wheel. And then you can see that there, this is where our cannon pinion sits. So basically this is our hour hand and this is our seconds hand. 
Um, now our hand is, is sits on the cannon pinion, which slides on top of this wheel, but we can see that that's how that comes through. So you understand the relationship more. Um, so that bushing holds that center seconds pinion in place, but that bushing has a tendency to come out. So Omega have upgraded the wheel um, to have a one piece construction. So we will be upgrading to that one piece construction. Um, even though the condition is good, uh, it's just a safer thing to do. Um, and we have direct, a direct access to um, Omega parts with our account. Uh, so we'll be upgrading, uh, upgrading that. Uh, we can have a look at our barrel now um, and check our end, end shakes and side shakes. So we just gently move up and down to see what kind of end shakes we have. Uh, and we can check our side shake, which looks quite good at this point. But again, we'll recheck after cleaning. It's so important to check our end shakes and side shakes because um, as you probably know, friction is the enemy of a mechanical timekeeper. Uh, well, friction is the enemy of a quartz timekeeper too, but um, any mechanical object needs uh, free play, needs end shake, side shake, uh, so that the watch can accurately keep time and have a good flow or an even distribution of power coming through the train. So that's why it's so important that if we have anything jammed up, if wheels don't have free play, uh, that's going to cause power and performance issues uh, with the timepiece. So now we can have a look at our balance spring. We can see it moving there nicely, but we can get a good look um, and view it from all angles of the movement. We don't have anything in the way. We don't have our bridges in the way, so we can check all angles of our balance spring to make sure that it's in uh, peak condition, make sure that it's flat and centered. It looks pretty good. Have to be a little high in one spot, so we'll correct that. And uh, we'll rectify that issue just probably by moving the stud down slightly uh, on the balance cock. Um, as far as concentricity of the hairspring goes, the balance spring, uh, it looks pretty good. But again, once it's clean, uh, we'll be checking that under the microscope uh, with the freshly lubricated balance pivots. Um, and when it comes to breathing between our curve pins, it's important that uh, it's breathing well. Um, and again, we'll check that with the microscope and try and get that, that film too. Our curve pins here, um, we have on our, on our regulating unit. Now what they do is they move up and down the terminal curve of the balance spring. And we move them across. Sorry, you'll have to excuse my rooster in the background there. Um, we move these across and basically it either lengthens or shortens the active length of the balance spring. Now, the active length of the balance spring is what determines the timekeeping. So if we move it one way and lengthen it, the watch will lose time because the balance spring has a longer travel. If we move it the other way and shorten it, the watch will gain time because the balance spring is shorter and has a shorter travel. So that's quite simply how we would regulate the watch um, on a watch that has um, these particular, this particular style of regulation. If a watch like a Rolex has weights, um, we would move the weights on the balance. But again, we'll go over that in a different video um, when we do tear down a Rolex that has weights. So we need to remove our... Anchor block springs. <clears throat> Excuse me, that one decided to take a jump. We need to remove our anchor block springs and put our springs securely back in place. And we need to remove our balance cock and balance from the watch. as if it doesn't want to play ball today. There we go. Usually tapping it will, will bring it out, but sometimes those steady pins, it's just in there.
So on our balance, we're going to do some checks before we before we clean. We're going to have a look at our impulse pen, and we'll have a brief look at our balance staff too. It's important that our balance staff, uh, which rests on the capsules, uh, is the correct shape to make sure it's nicely rounded on the top and not flattened off, uh, because that can give us amplitude issues uh, as well, as it increases the friction uh, that is on the watch movement. So now we can check our end shake of our pallet fork. which if I'm being honest, seems incredibly large. So that we're going to tighten up. Which will help us with our positional changes. So we'll check our stones. A couple of things we need to check on our pallet fork. We need to check our horns, where the impulse pin comes around and hits them. We need to check the faces of our stones. As I've discussed the horns a little bit more in detail over my blog. Uh, at precisionhorology.com. Uh, there's a post over there about um, escapement faults in Omega Speedmaster. Uh, so you can head over there and learn a little bit more about that. Uh, it's an interesting read if you uh, are enjoying the video and want to understand a little bit more about wear patterns um, in escapement. The faces of the stones look to be in very good condition. We have no cut marks or anything like that. A lot of the time we can have cut marks. Um, as the, the club tooth of the escape wheel drags across the face of the pallet stone, but we don't seem to see that here, uh, which is good. And our horns look shiny and sharp, so we have no uh, wear points there, which is also great. Uh, because we're not going to see any damage in that situation. So the final thing that we have to do is, I forgot to remove those. We have our um, dial screws still in place and we can definitely see some rust. Uh, on those screws they've got an oxidized uh, color so we'll get those cleaned up too and hopefully they come up uh, without needing to be replaced so the final thing The final thing that we'll do now is remove our winding and setting work, uh, remove our a, uh, bottom inker block jewel, and then we're gonna peg out the jewels. We just used a sharpened piece of peg wood um, to peg out the jewels so that they get cleaned up um, and we remove any old excess oil and things like that. So what we're gonna do now is we're going to do that, peg out the jewels, uh, put the watch through the cleaning machine, and then we'll get back to um, lubricating the actual watch. So thanks for watching part one, guys, of the Omega 551 teardown. Uh, please join me for part two when we look at the lubrication and rebuilding process uh, of the movement. So if you've enjoyed the video, please head over to my Instagram, uh, Ashton Tracy Horologist. Follow me there, uh, see what happens. Uh, you can check out my website too, Precision Horology. There's a blog there with interesting posts. Um, and please uh, leave a comment if you've enjoyed the video and uh, don't hesitate to get in touch if you need any, uh, any work done on your vintage timepieces. So uh, thanks again, guys, and we'll see you next time.